It's Wednesday, let's chat. Hi, I'm Kanan Janrin, the publisher of uh, StormAsia.com, and this is our regular series of discussions, a Wednesday web chat, or the web web chat. Um, it's been, what, now 18 months since we've uh, been living with uh, COVID and trying to get our heads around it. Um, things have opened, things have closed, uh, business, people have gone back to work, they've been asked to stay at home. Uh, it's been quite disruptive. Um, And all this has caused, of course, a lot of confusion in people's minds as to whether they want to go back to work or would they rather work at home? Um, Must they go back to work? You know, a lot of questions. And I think also the employers uh, are not sure. I mean, if people are working well in the context of their home environments, do I really want to bring them in again? Because then there's a cost involved. Uh, You you can lower your costs, your operating expenses, uh, your rentals or whatnot, that might be an, a good reason to also continue with the existing situation. So in any case, we are at 50% uh, in the office now, um, and we don't know uh, when that will change. But uh, I think uh, one of the things that this has done, this 18 months has done, it's, it's uh, affected us chemically as well. I think the brain uh, uh, chemical balance has been affected and uh, neuroplasticity, you know, the results of experiences which help you gain or lose synapses. But that whole process is vital for learning, for memory, and general healthy brain function. Uh, there are others who've uh, over the time felt lethargy, you know, there's been some brain fog, you know, a bit dif- of difficulty trying to remember things. And then there's another group who have such negative home environments in that maybe too many people, too many noisy kids can't get the children to keep quiet during important meetings. They are eager to go back to work. Uh, How will productivity be affected by all this, right? So are you looking forward to going back to the office? Um, Are we ready to return to the office? Today's panelists are well equipped to answer that from different uh, uh, aspects. We've got Davis Fung, who's a Vice President of Human Resources at Kemin Industries Asia. Uh, he's heading the HR function of the Asia Pacific region. Uh, Davis has been with Kemin uh, Industries for more than 15 years and has been working in the HR function for more than 30 years across different industries and sectors. And prior to joining uh, Kemin, he was the head of uh, HR for Singapore Land Authority. Uh, welcome, Davis. We've, Thank you. Uh, we've got uh, Richard Hoon, the founder and CEO of iSearch Worldwide. Uh, it's an international executive search practice. Uh, he's had over 25 years of experience in managing and fulfilling search uh, mandates around the world. Uh, he was a former managing director of Asia for an international search group. Uh, he used to work with a medical emergency company called International SOS. Uh, and was also the regional director for tourism for the Australian states of Victoria and Tasmania. Uh, welcome, Richard, again. Uh, good to have you on our sessions as always. Thank you. Thank you, Kana. And um, completing the trio of panelists, we have Jeannie Chu, who's a senior clinical psychologist at Resilience Clinic. Uh, she has 10 years of experience as a clinical psychologist and has worked in various hospital and ministry settings. Uh, her work consists of uh, psychological assessments and interventions, and she also provides consultations to organizations with the aim of enhancing employees' overall well-being and performance. Thank you, uh, Ginny. Um, welcome as well. Yeah, um, yeah. So I just wanted to start off by saying, you know, with uh, these 18 months, as I alluded to earlier, of uh, working from home, how hardwired would our brains be to continue in that process rather than be disrupted and have to go back to work? Now with the COVID situation, the change forced us to adapt to the current situation. And a lot of us have difficulties because again, COVID situations brings about uncertainty. Uncertainty always brings about a lot of anxiety and distress. So when a person is being put in distress, 
this person has to either read fight or flight, right? So a lot of, of us, let's say we are working from home, we have no choice. We have to really work um, to adapt to the current change. So if you think about neuroplasticity, when one person is being placed in an adverse condition, the brain will need to change. So if you, so basically, if if you, you have put in um, a difficult situation, you build what we call resilience, right? Re resilience is basically the ability to bounce back from an adverse situation, like trauma. So what I see in patients is trauma, but basically COVID-19, this situation is also traumatic for all of us. When we are being placed in this situation, if we are able to adapt, neuroplasticity happen, the better this person can then adapt to the changes. Does so, uh, so from in the context of employers and employees, right? How would we identify uh, the kind of people that works best in the different environments? Hmm. So, I guess um, so. For me, from my perspective, basically, it is to assess whether there are any signs of distress. Signs of signs of distress from an individual. So whether this person is exhibiting a lot of difficulties with um, coping with anxiety, coping with the stress from working from home. So if you're asking me from the science point, the scientific point of view, of course, I would actually look out for the signs and symptoms of distress and anxiety in this person. So whether this person can function at work, it's not just functioning, but let's say in comparison to the previous work perform performance, is this person deteriorating? Is this person really struggling to maybe even like going on Zoom meetings on time to complete the task on time? So all these measures can actually help to determine whether a person is coping well in the current situation. While it is not possible to, to have one, you know, to, to be able to classify any group of people that, that works well, I think through my our own observation, and I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of studies done, uh, the millennials seems to adapt better. Uh, from our own experience, working parents can be tough because of home, you know, if home may not be the best place, guilt for work. So that could be some areas. Gen Z, strangely, they are worried about the future. Why? Because they just got into the work. They are still soaking up all their experiences and wow, everything now <laughs> changed. So they, they are worried about the, that, that as well. Uh, we, we have also witnessed the jet, in, in terms of gender, the female employees get it worse. Why? They have to look after the, the family as well as continue to perform the job, you know? So in, in some families, you have the kids and you have people like me, the husbands, you know, who, who is going to add to more stress to the, to the females. Uh, so that's tough. Uh, baby boomers are struggling because they, part of their life is working in office and having to work from home is an unfamiliar place for them. So it, it's tough. So yeah, some, some kind of categorization, but mm -hmm. of course, it differs from individual to the individual. So if you know there's this NUS and Duke um, school, so they actually have, an, have a, a research done on this um, COVID situation. So researchers at this medical school actually found out that, so the statistics is one in three adults will suffer from the impact from this and all of this mostly from working from home. So basically female suffers more, which was some of the reasons that I explained. And then also um, those of slower social economic status, because again, they struggle a lot with um, anxiety, basically because um, again, the worries of, will I be laid off? Because, and for them, the impact, the impact will be huge. I cannot feed my family. I can't really provide for the family. So that is another reason. And one, I think um, from this research is found out that the age group from between 18 and 34, so this age group actually struggles the most. Perhaps if you think about it, I would think this is the age group where you are really focusing on work. So with this disruptive um, changes in the work environment, it contributes a lot of of uh, uh, this stress, distress, and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Richard, uh, from the point of view of uh, the leadership that you interact with, how do they view this? Uh, are they more for work from home, or are they, oh, let's get everybody back into the office fast? <laughs> Thank you, Kanan. I, I think it is uh, really a perceptive gap. 
um, the, the you know the the survey has been done, and I couldn't I can't find an exact uh, report where it's done. It says that leaders, sixty one percent of leaders, uh, you ask them now, they say they are thriving, which is twenty three percent higher than their subordinate. The subordinate is suffering, but the leaders think they are thriving. So it's a different situation from per- perception. Uh, I- I'm glad that Cheryl started with by talking about neuroplasticity because it's a concept that is very hard for us to, to, to say that, hey, you have to fail uh, to learn something. Uh, you have to suffer through. Uh, those of us who are baby boomers gone through a little bit more so we can go through. But the, the Gen Z has not. This is their first trauma. And sometimes we, we think that we should nurse them to death, you know. And uh, and but it, it, I'm glad it's coming from uh, from 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 Ginny uh, from that perspective because she's younger and she can understand that hey, also the young has to go through. So I think this experience is traumatic for a lot of people, particularly a younger group, uh, being first career uh, professional. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm glad that it's like a muscle that like you got to stress yourself through to 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 to, to do it. So what is important for leaders to understand is. At what point can the subordinate suffer stress without breaking? I think to learn how to bend is okay, uh, but to, to break is not all right. So we've got to train them in their resilient uh, and this experience. If leaders are mindful of that, then I think they can be more uh, cognitive uh, and can be more aware and they can be more engaging. If not, it's like, hey, there's a disparity gap between, I think it's not stressful. Why are you stressed? You know? uh, and they don't understand the situation. So, David, you're sort of like an intermediary between leadership and the employees. How would you get uh, a handle on that sort of situation, which Richard just explained, you know, bending without breaking? I think organization leaders need to be able to engage in a dialogue with the employees. And firstly, listens to, listens to them. I think it's, it's important and through that process, you realize that there's a variety of preferences. Uh, so that's one. The other, the other aspect of dialogue is also to make them understand. Uh, in organizations, uh, for example, like ours, we have a big group of what I think we are familiar with this thing called essential staff. That means even during lockdown, they are working. I have manufacturing staff, I have lab staff, they can't do their experiment at home. Uh, So this this big group of people is going to be left out in this whole conversation of remote work. And I think as an organization, we need to be inclusive. We need to also take that into consideration and come up with something that is uh, be flexible, but not breaking the bank. Every person has a different personality, okay, and a different motivation. So, for example, some, I just walked talking to my Canadian partner the other day, and he says, look, uh, for me, I'm dying because I have very high uh, EQ, you know. I need to be in the office. I need to be interacting with people. If you put me in a home, I'm dying. Uh, and, but he says, my colleagues who are introverted people love it. They love to work from home. So, now, so layering upon that, the role is one thing that they do, but to understand that, uh, uh, everybody have their own uh, uh, motivation in life. And if, if I think bosses uh, understand that, I think it, it helps a lot. You know, uh, many years ago, we talked about the war of talent, uh, attracting people to the company. The real challenge for this pandemic is uh, really leaders must, the new fight for bosses and leaders is retention. You have your people there before COVID. If you don't know how to keep them, they will walk. So companies who knows how to evolve and change with this, uh, keep that retention because they would go to another place that fit them a little better. Now, if they are manufacturing, they can't go to another place because they still have to physically work. But those jobs that gives the flexibility, then I think you got to understand this work-life. Now, the, the word that has been used in the past has been work-life balance, which uh, I, I don't subscribe to because anything you try to balance uh, is a stress by itself. Uh, so I, I share the concept of work-life autonomy, uh, which means give the, the staff uh, the autonomy to decide. So this is the collaboration between the leaders and the staff to, to know how many percent. There's, the company cannot prescribe, oh, let's, uh, you know, 60% go to work and, and 40% or 50-50. Let the decision be made by leaders. By doing that, the interaction is improving 
and uh, employees feel that they have been heard and understood, but leaders also know how to be better leaders. Um, there's a lot of job uncertainty now, right? And also with uh, businesses folding as a result of uh, a loss in business, uh, industries lagging, uh, will there be far fewer options for people to go into, uh, to take up uh, as, uh, you know, uh, if they want to consider a change in jobs? Or are employers now thinking, oh, I've got a much finer pool to pick from because there are more people out there uh, who are thirstier and hungrier for that position? What's it been like, uh, Richard? Uh, I think the perfect storm is coming. Okay, oh, it's already here. Uh, why? It's, it's very, uh, if you can read the sign, unemployment rates are falling. Uh, um, in the UK and US, it's, it's shown, you know, uh, in the UK, it's a one million job was available just in July of this year. In the US, it's 10 million. And this is all record high. However, in April, uh, in the United States, 4 million people quit their jobs. Okay? And because of all the pandemic changes, so they, uh, Microsoft did a study and says 41% of global workforce this year, the employees will be changing their job. 41% is what they have surveyed to find out. So what does it mean? Unemployment rate is, is, is low now. Uh, uh, it will be even lower going forward. A job opportunity will go sky high. Uh, there's a pent up demand. Uh, there's a big back, backlog because company hold back, uh, uh, not knowing where the situation is, so they don't invest uh, to do so. But the, the, when the demand comes, there's such a backlog, uh, backlog for it. And uh, it's a suppressed environment, right? There's hiring freeze, uh, people staying food, uh, put because they're afraid of losing their job. And then the talent demand goes up. So what does it go? What does it tell me? The perfect storm. So number one, if employees, employers don't retain their staff, they're going to go out and find and they're going to find that there's none out there uh, available for them. So keep their people better uh, too. Number two, employees who want to change, just make sure that you don't change from the frying pan to the fire. You know, <laughs> sometimes you wouldn't know which yeah. is which until you get into it, right? <laughs> correct, correct. So I uh, understand that. But uh, if you need to change, uh, I think the opportunity is in your favor at this point in time. Okay. How do employ? Uh, I mean, in your case, uh, David said, uh, "Do do you see that taking place? Yes. Do you see people? Yes, uh, yes. Well, what's the situation? I, I really want to. I really want to add on to this this conversation. Uh, I'm sure we all read about the revenge resonation. <laughs> you know, the, the want way. To just explain that for those who yeah. don't know. <laughs> it, it means that uh, for for some, uh, there there could be a whole bag of resignation during the last uh, twelve months or so, and 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 uh, here it comes. And then there is also a, there is, seems to be a higher expectation from organizations to be responsive to 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 employees' needs, and not, and 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 companies that fail to do that will face this onslaught. So that there is this concept, and uh, I have. I have a, uh, I have a business unit in US. Uh, we are we are related, Kevin, and uh, they have noticeably seen a higher level of resonation, you know, recently. And uh, like what Richard say, the storm likely to come, or if not, have started coming onto our shore soon. So, what does it all means to organization? Uh, it would means that. Talent retention is important. All right. And how do you drive talent retention, Manny? And I'm, I'm sure we all know. One is really how to, how to enhance employee experiences. And I think that's very important. So any HR, it should be something that keep them away at night. I'm sure there's one group of uh, people who would be a bit put out by all of this. Those who joined the company during COVID and have been working from home. They don't know who their colleagues are. Uh, they've not met their colleagues. They have plugged in, and now they're going back. I mean, that must be quite a strange experience, right? To seeing people for the first time, especially if it's your first job, you know? So what's going through their heads, Jeannie, you think, uh, this group of people? Well, I guess it would be, like you mentioned, it would be really awkward because it's like, I've seen you on Zoom. I've talked to you. We have managed projects together. We completed assignments together. 
However, I have not met you in person because if you think about the unique thing about working together in the office, there's a lot of unspoken interaction. You probably will walk past like an employee's desk and, oh, how are you doing? Then you crack up like small talks. All these small talks um, to the employers, in a sense, is not wasting time. It's actually fostering, you know, all these bonds and cohesion in a team that can actually help enhance um, social interaction between each other, enhance communication, is communication style outside work that can in turn contribute to team cohesion, especially when you come together as a, as a team to work on things, right? So I guess what actually can be helpful is basically treat them as new stuff, the traditional way. So what would HR do? You put them through orientation. So orientation helps them to understand you know, again, how the how the office functions in terms of structure, the workings. When I'm coming here from nine to six, what can I expect? So these are this might be common sense to all of us, but I guess to a, a newbie, this is really important. And also introduction to the work environment, not just the work environment, but the people. And um, not just for the newbies, if you think about organizing bonding activities, that can also help to incorporate, you know of us to come back together because again you've been 18 months apart you know i have not checked in on you for for 18 months it can be really awkward so it can actually help to foster team cohesion in that sense so not just for the newbies but organized team activities for everyone this will help to foster bonding the work from home situation has resulted in a lot of people not knowing when is a start and a stop time they've continued to work because you know it's a convenience of doing it or because there's expectation as well on the part of uh, whoever the superiors are that things will be delivered, uh, delivered on time or whatever it may be. Um, when you're back in the office, you are back again with fixed hours, uh, well, in the most part, I think, uh, and you've got the commute and you've got your home environment. So the clear you know, demarcation Obvious. between work yeah. and home. So how would that mental shift uh, be accommodated from somebody who's been always at home and working virtually all the time? Uh, if, you, if, if I look at it, there are four parts to look at. Uh, it's never in, individualistic. So uh, personal uh, employees have to take accountability, but their influence is only very uh, minimal. Uh, leaders have to make policy change, uh, and, and especially senior management at the top. So my four parts that I think we should look at on a more holistic basis is, uh, number one, I think we, we need to... Uh, the leaders need to have a plan. So it starts with policy. Policy is the top end uh, to make, you know, uh, how, how to plan the office, you know, what do we, who do we need to come back to the office for? What is the purpose of it? Which are the team we need to do? Have clear policy. Right now, because on and off, the policy is not clear. Now, this policy go beyond that. Uh, in terms of what about uh, evaluation? Uh, when, when we come to annual evaluation, there's a big, big uh, challenge coming in December. You know, how do I know whether my staff is working hard? when I don't see them half the year, uh, the, the, the whole year, you know. So I think they have to uh, hunker in and decide what is the HR policy given this change and so that we can communicate who has to come back and who has the flexibility not to. Then if you do that, then you got to do, do the whole thing on space planning. Uh, your office is not structured. You, you know, everybody have their cubicle in their offices now. Uh, the environment is very different. Everybody operates in the computer, they come back to the office and they don't even need their desk anymore, you know. Uh, all their personal things back home. They can't be shitting their uh, things back in the office all the time. So how does company begin to change uh, in terms of preparing the workspace that they have? But in addition, if there's a co-working, I mean, if there's a space they need to work from home, I think employers must also understand that, hey, you've got to uh, support some of these changes that uh, they have to go to at home because you know not everybody lives in a big house they live in a small little cubicle uh, home space in the, with their parents they don't have space to work but we need to provide an environment to work comfortably and securely as well third is technology and technology has already happened right uh, zoom you know teams uh, work from home are already happening so COVID forces us to use technology. However, the impact of technology is it means we are all tacked out, you know, or we call it the word now is we're all zoomed out. Uh, we are really, really tired. And to have meetings back to back, you know, employees think that we can, uh, at one hour meeting, have the next one, uh, uh, means that people have no thinking time. They have no time to, to disconnect and have space to create. 
Now, when you when you lose connection, you lose innovation. So that has also to, to understand. And the last part, I think, employ, employers who understand, create an environment of interaction, the fourth part, interacting with digital and with life, if possible, and be very creative. The company that is most creative in coming back with this interactive model between marrying uh, uh, technology and space planning, work from home, and still have a uh, connection with their, their bosses, I think those will be the market leaders. So yeah, it's not one piece, four, four pot to look at in my opinion. Office politics. Mm. Now, if you are in the office, you can see what's going on. You can get a sense of what's, what arrow is going to head your way. But if you're working remotely, it's going to come in out of the blue, virtually going to be hit between the eyes by an arrow. Has office politics become worse during uh, this uh, work from home environment? So actually, I want to, oh. and I want to suggest this. You won't believe it. I, I, I would say it takes a very brave employ, employer to allow politics time. Can you believe it? Okay. In the past, we have all the time, right? We want to just go to the pantry, we go out and have a chit chat and we complain about our boss. We just gripe about that, you know, uh, with each other. But now they're at home. Of course, they can call each other, but it's very much different. So I think uh, employers need to understand that this is going to be inherent in people. They need to talk, they need to ventilate, they need to just share with somebody. You know? Allow that, allow them time, allow them complain time, allow them time to grab about their bosses and keep it very confidential but allow them that and embrace it, you know. So now it's very radical going out there. I hope employers there would, would and, and allow that. And if there is, then employers feel that, hey, my boss trusts me, that, that my, my, my grab is actually harmless, is to, to aerate, to ventilate, you know. It's not to take a covert action to usurp the management. That's not what they want. It's one that somebody talk to. They're already stressed by themselves at home already. How about the corporate yeah. climbers? The corporate climbers within an organization, those that will stick a knife in somebody just to get up the... Those who want to play politics will play politics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, really, what, what Richard has said, really, uh, employees are really at the a, at a, at a worst end of all this because uh, studies have shown that they need to put in 30% more effort uh, just to achieve the same level of productivity that they have been doing uh, when they are in the office. A study have also shown that there's 40 billion more emails that comes, uh, you know, in February last year com compared to February this year. So imagine the level of stress and there's no, as you say, there's no demarcation. I think organization needs to really look after the mental well-being of an employee. Uh, and, I, and I say this linking back to what I talk about is about employee experiences. An organization during this time uh, would have to do more uh, with re regards to how they, how they look, you know, help to, to boost the mental well-being of the employees. And this is also back to relating to what Jenny has talked about earlier. This is over, also part of the overall resilient skill sets an organization can impart to its employees. Have yeah. you had a lot of people coming to you to seek counseling because they they just can't get you know the act together when they're working yes. from home? I was about to add on as well. I think um mm. I think both of uh, both Richard and Davis pointed out very good points. So basically, I think Richard was saying we need to allow the you know the, the employees to kind of really rent. Yes. So to answer your question, Canon, yes, I have seen a lot more cases since COVID last year. Um, yes, a lot has come to me because of anxiety related to work. Initially, the lockdown, okay, they don't really know how to adapt. So a lot of signs of distress. Why, like you mentioned, I guess, um, just now Davis was also saying you need to put in more to, to achieve the same level of work that you deliver. So this is really very stressful. And without this social contact with people, there's no one to vent, right? Like I mentioned just now, no small little acts actually help. You walk to the employee's desk, walk to your colleague, and you can just kind of vent it out. But now you, you lack that. So basically you're all keeping it in. And, and you need kind of somewhere to ventilate. That's where my job comes in. And to add on to um, what Richard said, right, it's not just to create the environment for employees um, or for employers to allow employees to do that. I think in, from the individual perspective, that's where I can come in, is to create what I call the mental space. And mental space differs for, every, uh, differs for everyone. 
So what you need to cope with stress might be very different from how some others cope with stress. So go back to your basic coping skills. How safe is the office? And Danny has uh, raised that issue as well in the question. How safe is the office environment? Uh, you know, you've got new variants of the strain coming out. Um, you've got mu now, right? Which is the latest one out of Colombia. Um, and what about your colleagues? What if they are not vaccinated? Uh, how should employers address that? Do you want them to come in if they haven't been vaccinated? Uh, the leadership of the organization is very cognizant with ensuring uh, safety on employees. And this has been constant throughout the last 18 months because it's very important. Uh, like I mentioned to you, I have essential employees. They come in throughout these last 18 months every day. So uh, it is number one priority for the organization to make sure that we have very strict safe management practices in the organization. So this will continue regardless uh, when, even when, you know, the rest of the so-called, the rest of the staff come back. And uh, we will have to, to look at situation where you have an unvaccinated employees, how we, how we deal with it. We have discussed this. Uh, I think the government has also been talking about this and I think they are calling out organizations to, to look into this. But whatever we do, we have to be very mindful that uh, we have to factor in uh, concerns of em employees. But also, we have to make sure that employees do not get a sense that just because they are vaccinated, uh, they are, they and they have to come in office, and unvaccinated don't have to. You, it's very, you, as an organization, you have to be mindful of that as well. So I so being being being, being mindful is one thing, but what do you do about it? What what are the firm steps? So so taken? yeah. So the government has actually uh, 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 talk about unvaccinated employees maybe have to do a ERT test twice a week. And who will pick up the cost for this? Uh, this is something that uh, the government has I think talked about this. Uh, they are. I'm not sure whether the position is firm yet. Uh, employees. Hmm. Okay. So you could is, see people who, on principle, may not like that whole uh, approach and decide to quit. Now, if you have a key performer in your organization, uh, Richard, you might also have uh, some leaders who might face this. Key employers, uh, key employees, right, bringing in loads of money for the business, do not want to be vaccinated. What do you do? Money or vax? Uh, I think it, it, everybody is different. Uh, we got, and these are the minority, actually, who doesn't want to be vaccinated. Um, and, and right now, they're really the minority. So I think there's a need for engagement. There's a need to uh, have some counseling uh, to find out why, you know, why they are doing it. Sometimes it'd be medical reason. Uh, it could be uh, they have some issues that they have some concern about. So company must, ha must address it. This is the new norm. You have no choice. It, it may not be perfect, but it is at least slightly better than uh, being a minority at this moment. And by the way, if it's a big income earner, they meet with people all the time. Unless they are a researcher uh, in the lab creating the next uh, uh, invention, then they may not need it. And, they, and then the company will find that it's worthwhile maybe uh, create a lab in their home you know, uh, to do so. But they have to have a life, right? So actually when we drill in, there are more superficial reason than the real reason. There's something else. They are the uh, effects, they are not the real cause. Mm. So, Davis, how was uh, year end assessment last year for you with, you know, with so many months of, of people working at home? How, how did you conduct that? And do you think that was fair? Did the employees think that was fair? Oh, but then uh, you had most of your people in the office, right? Uh, that, that is true. Uh, but I, I think the way the organization have worked uh, has always been very objective-based uh, assessment. So uh, I think one thing about our organization culture is uh, really objective, uh, very, as far as possible, very KPI and numeric. So uh, it's really, uh, at the end of the day, are you able to achieve those agreed upon results? And, and, and so I, it does not, I mean, the last job months, those who have been working from home, I don't think they have been impacted. Anyway, their boss also end up working from home, right? So it's, that's the thing. Everybody, everybody is in this together. 
you know. So it's equalizing to some yeah. extent. Uh. Yeah. yeah, except the home environment may be different, but okay. It's a lot um, more challenging, that's all, uh, to, to uh, conduct that review. Can I, yeah, uh, you, you hit a very good point. I think uh, Davis, uh, as the VP of HR, plus a lot of other head of HR, has to begin to think through. Because when it happened in the beginning of the year, goals were set in an environment where it was not COVID. This one, this year particularly they did, because we were already smacking it. So goals were adjusted uh, uh, and so forth. But they're going to set a new goal uh, in January, you know, or December, they're going to set a new goal. So in his company, in Kemin, they can be very quantitative in nature, and that's great. But not every uh, role can be quantitative. So how do you uh, measure the qualitative and the quantitative side without the interaction? I think that is the challenge. And I don't have the answer, but I think uh, they need to put our heads together to, so that if they are doing it, is it provides clarity to the bosses. It provides clarity to the employees to know, hey, this is the game plan. I'm going forward, right? And of course, build in some proviso that nothing is cast in stone. You know, when we plan our goal where it's 100% to be fulfilled and something happened along the way, we are so rigid, we are tight. So maintain a flexible uh, uh, policy, but also I think we need to ed educate our workforce through engagement that, hey, uh, change will come and we will change together with you, but trust and believe is, is paramount. When, when there's no trust, uh, then I think any small change is always read with with the worst case scenario. And that leads to demotivation. If a situation arises where we have to go into a lockdown situation again, having been through a few opening and closings and whatnot, how could we do this better? Just be flexible I, and adaptable. Uh, we don't yeah. know. Uh, we yeah. don't know where the future is going to be. We don't know what challenge is going to be. Uh, and I think it's good for Singapore as a whole. Uh, we, are, we are used to setting a goal and, and then have a clear path to fulfill it. Uh, this is life in euphoria. It doesn't happen all the time, right? And so we now learn to, to say that there's an overall goal, but our direction may change. We always try to associate something positive with change. Just give you an example. So like we all know Singapore now is going back to 50%. So we know employees are going to come back to work. And what we did was we, we actually ritualized certain things. When they come back, what we do is we greet them with... Uh, McDonald's breakfast, you know, uh, we link because the, the people who dread coming back were dread coming back, but we try to put a positive uh, experience to it. Those who want to come back will come back regardless of whether or not, you know, you have anything. The other things that we really need to do is uh, like what I have mentioned, have that dialogue with employees. Uh, like what have Richard, what Richard have said. In fact, in our dialogue, we tell them that we do not know how long this will this 50% will last. We may go to 100%. We may go back to lockdown. We don't know, but we will make those changes when it comes. So inbuilt that flexibility, all right? And uh, uh, everybody have to have that flexibility and open-mindedness. More importantly, uh, it is also a time for, for managers and for leaders, uh, which, we are, which we are doing, is to build that level of trust. Uh, if your trust level is high, as collectively as an organization, as a team, we can weather storm better. So in the past, it may not be so important. Now, with, the, with this new norm, it is paramount. I think now all of you, all of us know that psychological health is really important, right? So like even if, when I read, wrote down my, my review for this talk, basically change is the only constant. It doesn't happen actually because of COVID. All along, change has only been the only constant. Right. So I guess, again, building resilience, what do you need individually, you know, um, and perhaps I think what um, what can really help is starting from it. Are you, you are a leader or whether you are an employee? Change of mindset, changing, reframing, thinking about like, I like what Davis does is not take one positive change. So basically accept challenges, see adversities as challenges rather than difficulties. So by changing the mindset, you're already winning the battle. I just saw a program on TV the other day. This, the great, uh, uh, the Tuas Megaport uh, that Singapore is building that's going to complete, I think, in 2030. And I saw the whole thing and I was shocked. And I said, wow, do you know that the whole thing can be operated remotely? Which means what? That it only Singaporean. Yeah. So if we keep looking at just our shores, 
and we don't see the big picture with robotic AI and digitization, jobs can be taken away. So we must not only change to be internally better, to be resilient to face these cha challenges, we must retool, change our whole mindset to, to make sure that those jobs that we have can never be replaced by somewhere else. Someone else, somewhere else. That's all. It's a tall order. Yeah, it's a tall order. It's, uh, uh, it's easy for the larger, in the larger scheme of things, for governments to institute these sort of things. But when it drills down to individual companies, it becomes more of a challenge because there are different things in play. But I think uh, just looking at one of the comments from, uh, from HM Tan, it's uh, also about uh, uh, having to, being a bit more tolerant towards disruption. As Richard as you, and uh, Jeannie, as you both pointed out, uh, disruption is here. It's going to be here for well, as long as people are thinking and creating new things, right? So we've got to be mindful of that. Uh, and I think one of the uh, main things about going back to work is, I mean, for me at least, it's get the work done, right? It doesn't matter where you are. Uh, for me, I always say, here's your deadline. This uh, And this is what you're supposed to achieve in that time. Go do it. And if it's done, fantastic. If it's not, then we'll try and find a way where you can do it. 